Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maura Keefe. I'm one of the scholars in residence here. Um, welcome to the opening week of the 92nd season here at Jacob's Pillow. And welcome to Pillow Talks. Uh, we do these talks on uh, Saturday afternoons and an occasional Sunday. Next week, we'll be in conversation with Kevin O'Hare, who is the artistic director of the Royal Ballet. And the Royal uh, Ballet makes its Pillow debut on both stages uh, next week. Best place to find out about upcoming events, this is the commercial part before I introduce you, um, about all of the performances, workshops, talks, films, et cetera, that are happening on the pillow is on the pillow website or in the season brochure. There's so much going on on the grounds and beyond this summer. Now on to today. The title of today's talk is 50 Years of the Trox. And as you might suspect, we are inside not because of the weather, but because this is a video illustrated conversation. And I think a stroll through uh, dance history, maybe a little uh, history of performance, maybe a little New York history along the way. Before I introduce our guest, first a little setup. Ballet Trocadero was founded uh, in 1974. The immediate roots of the company are from a company called, Bal uh, pardon me, Tro Trocadero Gloxenia Ballet Company, founded the year before by Larry Ray. Gloxenia, primarily concerned with the drag aspects of performances, performed primarily in loft spaces in New York and catered to an audience particularly drawn uh, to that fantastic work. Le Ballet uh, Trocadero de Monte Carlo, from the beginning was equally concerned with choreographic craft and dancing in addition to performing gender. The founding artistic directors were Peter Anastas, Natch Taylor, and Anthony Basset. Just three years after their founding, the company had already performed on Broadway and on national television. Now, 50 years later, as the company says, the original concept of La, La Belle uh, Trocadero de Monte Carlo has not changed. It is a company of professional male dancers performing the full range of ballet and modern dance repertoire, including classical and original works in faithful renditions of the manners and conceits of those dance styles. Tori Dobrin, joining me today, uh, joined the company as a dancer in 1980 and is now the artistic director. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. This is such a, a great way to uh, start off the season, and congratulations on 50 years. That is not nothing in a cultural institution and dance companies in particular. Um, and I have to say, before I let Tori talk, is one of the things that I want to call attention to right from the beginning is that ballet history is fun, right? They get to do it every night on the stage. But for, uh, and we see that in the audience and we celebrate that. But for me, as a dance historian, I've been reading decades of reviews of the Trocaderos and it's been such a great delight to see um, what changes and what remains a consistent kind of thing people are talking about. Um, all the clips we're going to see provided by the company, but uh, when you want to see more, you can go to the reading room, see the performances from the company here in 2010, and later, uh, after this week, you'll be able to see the, company, the performances from this summer. So, so Tori, tell, tell um, me a little bit about 1980 joining the company. Before we look at any dancing, let's hear about you deciding this is the company for me. Uh, you mean way back when? <laughs> Who remembers? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, when I first joined in 1980, actually, uh, we did a very long tour to the uh, South America. And uh, in 1980 was the height of the military dictatorships. And so I'm quite sure that the uh, government whose permission we had to have, thought we were the Ballet of Monte Carlo. And I think that they had no idea it was a drag ballet company. So anyway, the, the audiences were so fantastic because they needed somewhere to put their energy in light of how restrictive and difficult things were. So it was just the most fun situation ever. The audiences were like screaming and throwing flowers. So this went on for quite a few weeks and uh, I got hooked. Uh, and uh, it's been uh, 44 years later, I'm still here. So at, how did you start to realize that maybe you had, that there are people who are uh, dancers and that's the, that's the fullness of their career, and then there are people who go into positions like artistic director. When did you start to realize that maybe you had um, a sensibility for thinking about 
not just what you would do every night on stage, but thinking about how the, how the company operated. I, I never meant for it to happen. <laughs> What happened is in the mid-80s, I guess I got hurt on stage, and the wonderful general director who actually was the founding general director didn't want to go to, on a tour to France, and he asked me if I would be the road manager, and I said, sure. And so that's how it started. And so uh, after that, it just accelerated, and um, here I am. Okay, so I want to start right away. For those of you who haven't uh, yet seen the performance this week, um, I want to start and you'll give us some setup uh, with um, a clip from La Vivendière, uh, the Parisis. Tell us something about this, or should we look well, first? Well, can I give a little background yep. of why yep. that happened? Yes. OK, so um, <clears throat> the difference between the Larry Ray's company with the Zagloxinia, as you mentioned, was that they were really into the drag aspect of uh, beautiful costumes. And Larry Ray was a costumer at the Met, and also the Joffrey. So he made these gorgeous, gorgeous costumes. But the three who broke away, actually, were more interested in dance um, satire, and so uh, they developed that. About 1980, when I started um, being a dancer, the, the city of New York uh, had all these, the, city, um, the, this, um, the cable station, CUNY had this, every Sunday they would show these old ballet Russe uh, photos, and also from the Kirov, and they were just so, at first I thought they were so, uh, mannered, and then I thought, oh my God, this is perfect for Trocadero. So, uh, so it, as the 90s went on, uh, I became friendly with Elena Kunikova, who is a uh, old, uh, not she's old, uh, but uh, she danced in uh, St. Petersburg at the Mali, and she started staging these old ballet, Russian ballets for us. And because you had been watching um, yes, the, the, was, the old documentaries or film footage of whatever, film footage yeah, yeah, from that yeah. she had, I guess she pirated. Uh, from the Kirov and you know everywhere else, and also in Russia they would show them on TV. So I guess she videoed them before she came to America. So um, so I would go over to her house and watch these great videos: La Vie Vandière, Harlequinade, uh, the Humpback Horse, uh, Esmeralda. And I thought, wow, these are perfect for Trocadero. And the reason why I went in that direction is because I went to see a ballet company at City Center. I won't give you the name, San Francisco Ballet, and they. <laughs> They did all spandex ballets. There was no tutu. And I thought, I want to see a tutu. I want to see a tiara. And so I thought, OK, we're finding our way now. So Elena set all these great ballets on us, including La Vivandière, which she had learned from the original uh, stager of it, whose name I can't remember at the time, uh, a French man who just passed away, uh, Lacotte. Uh, and so she staged this ballet, for instance. And that's really where we started to get a lot of attention from critics, especially in London, because we would start going to London, because they wanted to see these old ballets. And they had no opportunity unless they went to Russia. So um, my research into this ballet is that originally from 1844, right? Like, so rarely seen. It had been notated by the choreographer, um, Arthur Saint, uh, Saint Leon, and he was trying to show off his new version of notation and use this, this dance as, as like, here's how you might do it. And then it was reconstructed by the Joffrey in 75. Uh, no, by uh, Lacotte in, um, uh, for the, uh, oh, sorry. Lacotte for uh, the Kirov. And, and, and then the Joffrey did it in yes. 75. So, so that there's this like very few instances of people getting to see this. You're not going to see this on the ABT or, or City right. Ballet season. So here's, he, here's how they're doing ballet history. So let's look at a little clip can, from can this. I oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that, uh, you know, a lot of times you go to ballet companies and everybody likes to chore dance in the same way. Everyone likes to choreograph in the same way. But if you look at these uh -huh. older ballets, there is a rich, vocabulary that just is kind of losing its um, mojo with the uh, contemporary choreographers, which is fine because, you know, we're doing on something else these days. But if you watch the part of this, you'll see there's very interesting, actually, ballet choreography, ballet technique, which is, uh, I find very, if you're a ballet nerd, you'd like these, um, uh, this expression of technique and steps, so. Thank you. 
Can I just say one yes, thing? Yes, please. So the lead uh, ballerina is Joshua Grant, who went on to become a soloist with the uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet. And he just retired, I think, last year. And uh, the, the male dancer is actually Long Joe, who actually is now dancing in Dusseldorf, which is a really nice ballet company. But he's a guy dancing on point. And for instance, he takes the male class, because they divide the class up, but he does it on point. And at first, this is just here. He's, did it, he's joined this year there. And uh, at first, people were like totally perplexed, and now they totally accept him. And that's really great. So. Um Tell us about the staging of that, or the, no, let me say the casting of that, and, and how um, you're making choices as artistic director about who's doing what role. Um, because we're touring, I'm not going to really answer your question fully, and I'm not uh, obfuscating, but <laughs> we're a small company and we're a touring company, so everybody has to learn every role. So uh, when we set a new work, uh, everyone in the room, 16 dancers, let's say, everyone's learning any, everything. And once they learn their thing, they are learning another part. So that's how we, we basically do it. In this role, in this ballet and, uh, specifically, uh, it worked really well to have a huge, tall ballerina and a short guy. So that's, that was the choice for that. We have actually done it not that way, but that works really well because instantly you laugh. And don't forget, the point of, the, of uh, the story for the audience is to laugh and then enjoy the technique. So uh, hopefully you'll do both on equal measures. But uh, so in this case, we wanted a tall ballerina. And also the vocabulary is hard. I mean, you didn't see the hard part of the leading dancer there, but it's hard stuff. Uh, yeah. So it needs to be a good dancer. Um, I, and they are um, brutally short clips. And I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. We have more time for conversation. But I, I, I wanted to call attention to that cast because that in that instance, that's the thing that we are noticing about the humor, and that secondarily we might be noticing the beautiful, the beautiful tool skirts or the the dancing that they're doing. Um, even if we've never seen this dance before, we're already um, we're, we already know some of the tropes. And so, um, without the casting, uh, what would be funny in this from your perspective? That's enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of the what we do is uh, personality based. So uh, we actually have a way of organizing our performance. So the first performance is usually Swan Lake, and then we throw the kitchen sink. You know, we have the new music hall jokes. We have the uh, you know the, the obvious jokes. We have the ridiculous jokes. We have the character jokes, and then in the second act where this falls, we kind of. We try to change it up so that the audience is not seeing the same thing all evening long, because that can get very, very tedious. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what we're trying to demonstrate here is these old, uh, we're not, again, we're not trying to educate the audience. We're trying to entertain the audience. So we, we find a way to uh, be engaging and pleasant, and then we throw in something like that. Uh, and then we play with the convention of a, a little guy dealing with tall people and things like that. And so that we find the humor like that, and it comes out very naturally. We actually don't inject the humor, uh, because that tends not, you know, when you're, um, <clears throat> if you inject the humor, then it's more of an intellectual exercise rather than a natural funny exercise, and that's really better for humor, just to, for it naturally to come out. Also, we've done many cast changes with this ballet, and every ballerina, every guy, every they all have to do it in their own way. Because you can't have Lucille Ball and Joan Rivers with the same material do it in the same way. So it really depends on the leading dancers, that uh, we depend on them to bring their own brand of comedy to it. Did I answer the question? Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you more about that in a moment. But um, here's an example of something different where it's also because it's a story ballet. We're looking at Giselle. Um, and um, even as recently as uh, Alistair Macaulay writing in the New York Times said uh, about Giselle, or not about Giselle, but about ballet in general, that feels like an apt moment. This is from 2016. Ballet is a completely absurd art, and we love it to pieces. That's what Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo proclaims with every move. So let's see what uh, Giselle proclaims for us. We're in act two, and it's an older uh, clip. Thank you. 
that's not something that we said do it like this. We taught them the steps and they created their energy towards it, and you all laughed. It was funny, right? So <laughs> but, I, mean, I laughed too. I, I gotta say, the um, complicated relationship with music and rhythm seems is is a thing that catches us, and you'll see it in the pro, in the theater tonight. But so hard for well-trained dancers to play against rhythm and musicality at times. What do you think? Uh, or talent? We right? do not use the word hard. <laughs> This is the job, and you want to do it because you want to please the audience, and so we do it. The minute you put it in the hard, you can't do it. <laughs> I, I don't know if you noticed that uh, all of our music is double time. And when a dancer first joins and they say, it's too fast, I said, it's not too fast, you're too slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's go to Giselle. Giselle, I love that ballet. And, and we'll be doing it at the Joyce this year, so. <laughs> so I, I think I, I'm w wanting you to talk a little bit about when the story gives you some information to work with as a company and that it's not um, simply about, for the first example was a little bit about the casting, right? And this one, we also have the characterizations that um, have been with us since the mid 19th century. Could you say something about how that, um, how that influences the dancing. Uh, sure, and while I'm thinking the, of the answer, uh, let me, can I just point out that yeah, the dancer please. who uh, did that is Sanson Candelaria, who was Tamara Boumdieva, and he was actually the first real super good dancer to join the company. He joined in the very late 70s, and he was fantastic, not only as a dancer, he had been a, a principal with Boston Ballet, and he had also danced with Nureyev at the uh, oh, you're from the upstate New York area, aren't you? The um, Kathleen Crofton uh, uh, Frontier. Frontier Ballet Company. Yeah, so uh, Sansone danced there, and um, uh, he was not only a great dancer, he was a great comedian. He just broke all of our hearts, but he was so subtle in his, in his humor, and he was the uh, unabashed star of, of the company until the mid-'80s, and he really, in my mind, put the company on the map because of the strength of his performance. Uh, and he was absolutely great. And of course, unfortunately, he was one of the first uh, persons to die from AIDS, uh, which was, had been a big problem in the company uh, and the world. Uh, so uh, I forgot your question. Uh, my question is about, about that um, Giselle offers something else to work with for a Trocadero, but be, because there is, there are the willies, there's, there's Queen Myrtle, there's, there's uh, poor Giselle who dies and goes mad from her broken heart. So what we try to do is we try to bring out the viciousness of the willies, <laughs> uh, and that they had been dug up from the dra grave, and so we, we uh, uh, feature that a lot. We also feature how Giselle uh, in, sometimes can be considered a, 
mm, a weak and pathetic character, maybe? We all oh, know, not in our world. Uh, strong character and dominating the performance as a ballerina. And the prince, who is considered a cad, we uh, kind of uh, have him as a, um, a dumb guy. So we play with the characterization that way. Also, the Mirta becomes extremely vicious about the whole thing. So we play with the characterization in that regard. That's where we find the humor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, we have the digging up of the grave and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, we throw the print, uh, Hilarion, who you, those of you who know Giselle, we throw him into the pit, uh, you know, things like that. I will also say that the backdrop uh, and the coffin was designed by uh, Edward Gorey. Oh, nice. So I nice. still have the original drawing at home, and so if we ever run into a problem financially, I will sell it, <laughs> and it will save us. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you um, mentioned the dancer here because one of the things that um, seems like from my reading and from conversations we've had in the past is the, the difference in uh, at what point in a dancer's career in the 70s potentially they were ready to join the company uh, maybe after their performing career with another company maybe they were older dancers um, versus today and how dancers now this is their dream is right away to join that and could you um, could you talk about it's, i think it's not so much the the dancing has gotten better but it's like as if people recognize that this is serious work in addition to being entertaining and fun I will say unabashedly the dancing has gotten better. Uh, the lead of Piquita, for instance, uh, major ballerina under any circumstance in any ballet company. The only difference between him and, let's say, you know, D Diana Nivishneva is he has these really big, strong legs, and she would not want those big, strong legs. But it did. Did you see him all the pirouettes he did and everything? So uh, when I joined the company, we were older. We were competent dancers, but can't compare today. Uh, when I joined, I was handed a pair of point shoes and said, go for it. And so it takes you, uh, you know, a year or two to uh, get familiar. Now, and society has changed so much. We all know that. For instance, when I joined in 1980, there were no children in the audience. Now there's tons of children. So that indicates how much society has changed. Same thing with the, um, the, the dancers. At first, you know, we were not respected uh, at all. It, I would say in the 80s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. Uh, we, then we did this documentary, not documentary, we filmed a couple of performances at Maison de la Danse in Lyon, and those, uh, that video went all over the world. It was shown in outdoor festivals, and dancers, especially in Europe, saw us and wanted to do that. And also, <clears throat> we're not a gay show, per se, uh, because we don't address gay issues, but there's tons of gay sensibility, because uh, except for the people on, um, in our administration and so on, and we're all gay guys on stage. So there's a lot of gay sensibility. So people who wanted to express that, you know, gay guys around the world, uh, they have an outlet for it. And so sometimes we get, uh, I feel like I'm not answering your question. No, that's okay. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I wanna hear this and I'll, uh, I'll come back. Sometimes we get guys who are interested in the drag uh, aspect of it. Sometimes we're the point shoe aspect, and sometimes the classical ballet aspect, and sometimes the comedy aspect. And we like all of that ingredients because it gives each individual a different point of view. And so from an audience point of view, I hope you saw this, is that you're seeing a variety of different personalities on stage. It's not cookie cutter. Uh, and you can tell the difference between one and the other because they all come with a different point of view and a different um, uh, sense of humor. So uh, l let's talk about the, um, you said unabashedly the dancing has um, gotten better. And I'm thinking about um, the, the muscularity that comes with training for men, whether they've been on point shoes or not, that they would have learned that kind of bravura performance and that that, that can be summoned in the same way as the kind of refinement of what a, a woman would be trained to do. And I'm thinking of it in, is it in Paquita where the, the uh, soloist does the double tour, which is not typically done by women as soloists. And so um, how is that fair? That's, I guess, I've sort of been thinking a little bit about, about um, the, the, that it's not an attempt to only be the ballerina and her, her world, I think is what I'm thinking a little bit about. Well, first of all, I'll say life is not fair. <laughs> <laughs> When I was born, God did not look down on me and say, oh, 
your life will be beautiful, nothing will go wrong. No, life is definitely not fair. Uh, we're an all bell comedy company. We're not competing with women mm -hmm. at all. We don't want to. We, we, we have a point of view. And so he's doing double tours because he does great double tours. <laughs> and it's very musical and it looks good and it's surprising. Mm -hmm. So we want to surprise the audience. And weren't you surprised? Yeah, three beautiful double tours. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's why, did I answer that question? Yeah, so you're saying that, that, um, that uh, everything is welcome and, and like that, that whatever is going to make the, the dancing best from both the, the technical and virtuosic aspect, but also from the entertainment side. Abs <laughs> absolutely. We want to mix it all up and surprise people and show what we can do. And if we can't do it, we won't show it. Uh, I, I will say about the point work and stuff is that uh, <clears throat> I like to say that what we're doing is not a refined point work. What we're doing is, I say, pl blunt instrument point work. <laughs> so it's sort of like we think of the point shoe as a, as a piece of equipment. So it's like tennis. So Steffi Graf and Andre Agassi, I love Steffi Graf. Uh, they go on the practice court and they do the same exact strokes. You know, They practice all those same exact things. And then they get on court and Steffi Graf is this beautiful uh, grace to her as she runs around the court. I don't know, you must all know tennis, of course. And then Agassi looks to me like he's just hitting the ball hard, which is also effective. So we're not Steffi Groff. We are Agassi. We're hitting the technique hard. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing something very usual in an unusual way. Mm -hmm. And that also is lending itself to, to the depth of the company and what you see, the projection. So, um, and that, as artistic director, I think you're saying you want to maintain that even if men are coming with all the experience of, of being on point earlier in their career, unlike you when you joined the company, you still want it to be a blunt instrument, the point work. Well, let me refine that a little bit. Uh, point work is a, a highly uh, developed skill. Mm -hmm. So even if the guys come, come, become, uh, come here comfortable on point, that doesn't really mean they know how to dance on point mm -hmm. uh, in, a, comf in, a, in a, a good way. So our ballet master, Rafa, Rafael Mora, he teaches point classes and has tips, and he's danced all the roles, of course, so we refine what they're doing, and so it's still a kind of ref refinement of mm -hmm. technique. For instance, like when you, just as an example, when you do a bow at the end of Paquita, you can walk off and not point your foot. Uh, but they, in, before they step, they point. And that's something that a guy would never learn in school, but a girl absolutely would learn that. And so next time you go to a ballet company, and that's what I look for, see if the girls are pointing their feet before they leave. <laughs> Sometimes they're not. And I'm thinking, isn't the ballet master watching this or the ballet mistress? <laughs> so that's what's important to us. And using the foot in a proper way, they don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. But they know how to get up and down on point. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a little nice. difference. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a, a ballet works, neoclassical and classical works, uh, romantic works this week here. Uh, last time you were here, you did a piece called uh, Patterns in Space, uh, choreo Choreography After Merce Cunningham, um, which shows the kind of the uh, modern canon that you also take on. So we're going to look at a clip of Peter Anastas's Yes, Virginia, Another Piano Ballet. Do you want to say something about well, this? Can before? I talk a little bit yep. about Patterns in Space? Sure. Because it's a really great story. So uh, we were very friendly with uh, Meg Harper, who has probably been here on multiple mm -hmm. occasions. She was in the Cunningham Company, I think in the 60s or 70s. Sure. And uh, she, we were very friendly with her. And she asked Merce Cunningham uh, if we could have, not have, but license one of his pieces. And he said, sure. So he gave us cross currents. And he didn't, we licensed cross currents. And we premiered it in London, where it was premiered. And uh, the, the stipulation is that we couldn't change one step. And of course, we, we change every step possible in order to make it work and find funny. So I tried to get the same music that he had used for it, which was Colin Nancaro. And it was so expensive uh, that I thought, we, you know, we can't possibly use the music. So I came back to rehearsal and said, oh, we can't get the music. What do we do? And so <laughs> the ballet mistr mistress, Pamela Probisco, who worked here uh, quite a number of years, she started uh, Improvising, you know, so the dancers would have some music or whatever. And we all joined in and we all started laughing hysterically. And so what did we do? 
We put two musicians, our dancers, on stage and they improvised the music. <laughs> and that's where we found humor. <laughs> and so, you know, we didn't think about it ahead of time and that's how it developed. Mm -hmm. Now, Merce Cunningham came to see us at the Joyce and he said uh, that he thought the dancing was fine, ballet dancers doing my choreography, but he was generous, but he was angry that we were making fun of John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Isn't that it's very good. He's sitting right there behind you looking at you right now. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's a great story. You know? And John Cage, as we all know, did all sorts of wild things. So. <laughs> Uh, so you want to say anything about Yes, Virginia, or you want us to look at it first? Yes, Virginia was something that Peter Anastas did early on. We had revived it for our 50th anniversary. We stopped doing it because uh, theaters got very angry because we were jumping all over the piano. So they said, you got to stop that. So, uh, and so we revived it for our 50th anniversary. And uh, it's based on Dances at a Gathering, which is Peter, uh, uh, Jerome, Jerome Robbins. Robbins was all very naturalistic, you know, a bunch of people in the park just celebrating humanness. That's what the ballet is about. So there were two reasons I wanted to show that. One is that you had told me that you enjoyed dancing that work. Um, and two, I also really, um, as much as I'm thrilled by uh, the advances in technology that, that give us digital recordings and make the videos in the archives even better than they ever were, there's something about this and um, the lack of definition that I could imagine somebody walking by seeing it on a screen and not realizing um, not realizing that it's a cast of men. And uh, I think there's something particular, uh, and I think the age of the technology um, adds to that. So uh, I, I wonder if you could say something about the kind of, that some people, that, that every performance, there's somebody who doesn't know they're going in to see a company of men dancers. Well, most people do because the Jacob's Pillow advertised Ballet Trocadero as an all-male and they had, you had to buy a ticket, so hopefully you knew what you were buying a ticket for. But somebody today didn't know that the last ballerina was a, a guy. He, she thought he was a, a girl. And I had to uh, convince this person, I don't know if they're still here, but uh, who uh, thought it was a girl. So yes, that happens a lot. I mean, and I, I, um, I'm wondering uh, about the kind of, with, with uh, 
I mean, th that is the conceit of the company, right? That that is, that, that is an organizing principle at its at, uh, artistic and aesthetic foundation that it's a company of men. But there was a woman last night at, at, at intermission that said, oh, oh, I didn't realize that same, that same thing, the surprise of it. So um, what do you think about that moment of discovery for people? Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly no, I think it's, I mean, because I, I think, uh, I think that the, the, from, from my viewing of it, who is dancing, it's about the dancing. And then there are the insistent reminders that you call our attention to about wh with however humor works or, or whatever, that it is very possible in watching it, and this is perhaps the shift in the dancing um, or increase in the technique and training of that it is just about the gorgeous dancing at times as well as the entertainment and not who's doing it. Well, we're trying to set it up earlier in the program. So you saw Swan Lake, for instance, the curtain goes up and a, a character dancer dances around. So the audience is uh, seeing the joke, he gets tired and so on. So the audience is saying, oh, okay. This might be funny. And then Benno comes out with uh, Prince and they have this exchange, also a little bit funny. And then the first drag ballerina comes out. So the, the audience actually has a moment to uh, settle into the idea. And then it's quite clear when the Swan Queen comes out that it's a guy, I think. At least it's clear to me. So that's how we kind of introduce it. Uh, so uh, that you're deliberately showing male characters first. We're, we're, you know, it's sort of like uh, when you go into a nice restaurant, you just don't have the main course first, you know. <laughs> so you have a glass of wine or whatever, and then you have the hors d'oeuvre, and then you have the main meal. So that's basically what we're trying to do. Just, you know, to make it uh, nice. You know, people, not so much here because it's gorgeous, but, you know, you come off the street, and, you know, the traffic, the getting to the theater. We ease it, uh -huh. uh, the audience uh -huh. into it. Uh -huh. So um, let's talk a little bit for a moment about um, coming into the company and um, the act of naming oneself or being named uh, as because every dancer has more than one identity in the company. Could you talk a little bit about that process? Sure, the names actually started because, uh, just as a little history, is that, you know, in the old Ballet Russe, when uh, Diaghilev uh, came from Russia after the revolution, he was, he lost uh, access to the Russian dancers for the most part. Not totally, because obviously Balanchine and uh, Danilo came. But he started having to hire European dancers who didn't have Russian names, but everyone considered to be a good dancer, you had to be Russian. So even in the, you know, in the 80s in ABT, it was a big to do about that. So for instance, a teacher that I had in New York was Nina Straganova, but she was uh, Danish and she was out to dinner with uh, Leonid Messine and she was talking about joining the company and he, they agreed she would join the company and she was eating beef stroganoff. <laughs> she became Nina Straganova. So the teacher I had in Los Angeles where I grew up was Patricia Denise. She was Alexandra Donisova. You know, so that's, so that's why we change all the names and give everybody these ridiculous names in homage to that time. So that's part of ballet history. And I've lost track of your question. So I'm curious about like, so a uh, new company member. Yes. Are you naming? Do you have a roster of future names that are witty that you will uh, bequeath on somebody in a knighting ceremony? Well, this is probably not believable, but we go to Japan a lot and uh, I love Kabuki and you know, the names are passed down in the family. And actually, we have a lot of Japanese sensibility. Uh, not hard, to, it's hard to find, but there is a lot of Japanese sensibility. For instance, the lighting. We want the lighting to be bright so you can see it. A lot of times you go to dance companies, you can't see it. So I insist on lighting that everyone can see, and that's hallmark of Kabuki. I mean, so they pass the names down. So I like to keep the names sort of around because it lends uh, to a kind of historical sense, and I like that. Um, and so what happens is usually uh, we lose a dancer and we hire a dancer and I gotta send the program out immediately. And so I just choose the name. And so uh, I have a whole, in my computer, you know, names and uh, I'm actually kind of good at it. You kind of look at them and figure out a name. Uh, so that's how that happens. And so uh, what about the sort of pretense and theatricality? Are you using the names off stage? Are you using them in rehearsal? Or is it Tori? 
do mm -hmm. this do this uh, section of the Padasis today? Well, uh, no, you know, like uh, gay guys tend to, you know, play around with names. I mean, Raffaele was Lariska. Sometimes I call him Lariska. Uh, Ida, Paul Gieselin, who has danced with us many years, he was Ida. Even his parents started calling him Ida. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> my name was Margaret, and people call me Maggie. You know, I mean, so we play. It's part of the fun. Mm -hmm. Part of the fun. Uh, so, yes. Okay, I want to look at one last clip before we open it up for some of your questions and comments. This is uh, Odalisque. Do you want to say anything about this? Odalisque was actually the first ballet that we did with Elena Kunikova. For the, our, it began our Russian uh, journey. And I wanted to see if we could do it, because it's uh, actually very sophisticated choreography. ABT does. I saw the Kirov do it when they came to the Met, I guess in 1980, uh, I don't remember when, early 90s. First time they came uh, after many years. And I saw this in the full, full length Corsair. And it's actually beautiful choreography, very sophisticated. And what we're doing is we're exaggerating it. For instance, you'll see there's a lot of chin down like that, which the Kirov doesn't do, but we do as a way to uh, exaggerate the style. Um, and I think it's a delightful ballet. Thank you. <laughs> You know, it's exaggerated dancing, but they're still doing all the steps. <laughs> but it's just we make it fun. Uh, also, there was a part where they could have actually bumped in the end, but we didn't give you the bump <laughs> because it's too obvious and everyone would be waiting for it. So we didn't do it. We have done it in the past, but not there. I, I have to say one of the reasons I also love this is the beautiful costumes. And um, I, I feel like the... Uh, Part of, it's part of the visual pleasure as well as the kinesthetic pleasure to see these kind of costumes. Uh, can you say something about working with a costume designer? Sure. Well, the costumes in this case was done by Mike Gonzalez, who uh, was a really creative, he was also a dancer, but a really creative uh, costumer. Uh, and he passed away many years ago already from HIV, but uh, I mean, who in their right mind would put green costumes on a ballerina? That's just not a normal color, <laughs> but they work beautifully. Uh, and so the important thing about the costumes, first of all, is that they're sturdy because guys tend to be harder on clothes than girls, I think is a general sense. And also they're bigger and they dance more uh, with more, uh, uh, a, uh, well, that's not true. The, you know, they just dance and destroy the costumes easily. So, <laughs> the, so you have to actually be sure that you know you're sewing them well and all that. Uh, and but the important thing is to kind of do the correct style, but then add a twist so that it's not exactly classical, but there's something about it which uh, is a little uh, eccentric. And that's what we're looking for. So we worked with Mike Gonzalez for many, many years. And lately, we've been working with a, a man named Ken Busman, who also danced with us and has been working in the costume shop of uh, Boston Ballet for many, many years. And uh, he's actually going to do the new costumes that we have for Symphony. So costuming is an important element. And so even in the program, we try to have different colors. Like today, you saw the white costumes of Swan Lake. We based our Swan Lake, by the way, on the Royal Ballet Swan Lake, which oh, is coming the connection. next week. There it is. And uh, then the last ballet is Paquita, which is very colorful. You know, you saw the Gopher Barocco, which is the Balanchine style. So then we try to mix it up with costumes uh, like that. 
Let me open it up for your questions or comments, and I will uh, repeat them um, so everybody can hear here and then here. So first, uh, could you say something about the name Trocadero, and then tell us about future commissions and uh, reconstructions? Peter and Anastas, uh, Match Taylor, and Anthony Besset, would, if they thought the company would last 50 years, would have never named it what we have, <laughs> because it's almost impossible to explain. But I will do very quickly, <laughs> is that, uh, Charles Ludlum and the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, he liked the name of the Gloxinia Trocadero Ballet. And that we don't know, he loved uh, flowers. And Trocadero was actually a drag club in New York that did drag, but also it harks back to Paris a little bit because of the Trocadero Hill, where the Ballet of Chaillot is. So it has a lot of um, uh, connotations, and then they added the De Monte Carlo in homage to all the ballet russe companies that floated around in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s after Diaghilev passed away. So that's how the name evolved. And uh, future, future projects, commissions, and uh, choreographic residencies, say something well, about that. Well, uh, our development mm -hmm. lovely person, Lauren, has got, received a grant to do a choreographic institute so we actually hired uh, somebody named uh, Durante Vers Versola, who came in in December and uh, staged a ballet I've been wanting to do for a long time, his homage to Symphony in C uh, by George Balanchine. And we call it Symphony, and it's to Gounod Music, which is, who is the uh, teacher of um, Bizet. And so we just finished that in uh, December. And uh, we actually, thanks to the uh, Jacob's Pillow, we were able to tech it here, which was really great. And we're going to premiere it in October in Kitchener, Ontario, and then perform it at the Joyce. So that's one of our new things. It's a full company closing. It's like Paquita closes the evening. And it's lovely. The guy is lovely choreographer. The movement just poured out of him. Now, the question is humor, no humor. So. When we choreograph something, we don't actually put the humor in. The humor comes naturally in rehearsal. So right now, the ballet is not humorous, but we will have, the dancers will be, find their charming ways to project, and we will add, in the appropriate moment when we see it, a joke here or there. Also, it's the last part of the evening. For instance, when you saw Paquita tonight, it's not filled with jokes like Swan Lake is, and that's because, it, that, in my opinion, that gets tiresome. At some point, you just want to stand back and have a look. And that's what this ballet will be. Mm -hmm. uh, did I answer mm -hmm. your question? Yes. 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 This is a question about one of the performers from this afternoon, redheaded dancer, uh, who seems to be particularly magical in his sense of humor. I, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Rafa, do you know who that is? Redheaded dancer? I think no. it's a, the, is it a ballerina in Swan Lake? It's ah, okay, so in, uh, the question is, who is he, or, I'm sorry? Well, we call that place that he was, we're talking about the ballet uh, Swan Lake. There's this one who, guy who's a little bit of a lunatic, right? <laughs> okay, so that we call that position Joke Swan. So the person who does the Joke Swan always has to be someone who's very expressive uh, fa facially, as, as well as uh, on top of things, uh, dancing wise and uh, he is Japanese and we have others as well who do it and have always done it but he's specifically Japanese and uh, I don't know if you uh, know he has an incredibly expressive face so what we did is we explained what the situation is and he created that and that's his own now when somebody comes in and changes it, it will change uh, remarkably. So if you see Swan Lake again, you'll say, oh God, I don't remember that. And the reason is, is that every dancer does it a little differently. Today you saw Jake uh, Speakman do Swan Queen. If we're invited back to the uh, Jacob's Pillow in a few years, and I hope we are, uh, a new ballerina will do the lead dancer so that the, uh, uh, the public won't see the same ballerina. Could you say something about the, um you want them to find their own, uh, their individual take on the roles, but you're also working with them on crafting that, uh, that, that character in a different kind of way from coaching them in their uh, training as dancers. It's, I'm talking about a little bit about the coaching of 
facial expression and some of the more things that I would think of more in the realm of uh, dance, uh, sorry, acting. Could you say something about that? Sure, I mean, there's lots of different types of guys who join the company and some guys actually need help. Uh, and if they need help, they actually get, don't get to do a lot at first and they are, you know, they watch whatever people, other people are doing to get um, an idea of what's appropriate. We try to explain, you know, the storyline or whatever. Uh, but then there's some people you have to stay out of their way because they have an innate sense of of what what to do. You don't tell Lucille Ball how to approach her character in I Love Lucy. You, no one needs to do that. Uh, she knows how to do it. And we have a lot of guys like that who, uh, the dying swan, Bobby, uh, who's been with us many years, he doesn't need help. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, so some people you stay out of the way and some people you help. Uh, and uh, it, it, if you need help, it takes time. Uh, because it's not necessarily part of a dancer's training at all to be thinking about uh, anything except the action of the movement, maybe. Well, we spend a lot of time, uh, it's called face notes. Like, I don't know if you noticed in Swan Lake when the core is standing on the side, if, <laughs> if, uh, if you go to New York City Ballet, which I love, you know, you look, I look at the core a lot, you know, and uh, sometimes the girls are just standing there and looking like, they want to be in somewhere else. And then there's some who are smiling. So, you know, um, so we have face notes. So the dancers, for instance, in Swan Lake, or they're standing on the side. We're saying, you need to engage your face so you don't look miserable or sad or something. <laughs> and we always say the, re the way you do that is in engaging your cheekbones. Also in Piquita, when they're standing there like this. You know, we really talk about engaging your face so that the energy, I mean, it, it's not just, that it just it's uh, the total energy has to support the leads mm -hmm. so everyone present has to be totally it's like tennis you know you just can't hit the ball you got to be totally engaged to do it so everyone on stage has to be totally engaged to elevate what's happening on stage and even if the audience uh, doesn't know that particularly you can feel the good energy coming off the stage and I did you feel the good energy coming off the stage everyone was very very present yes. we have time for one last question yes so this is a question about the point work and and her observation is that she doesn't come from ballet training herself and wondering about um, men and uh, whether it's becoming increasingly part of a, a young man's training to dance on point as well uh, uh, the point work actually sometimes gets a bad rap because uh, these uh, girls who are very young, uh, they actually don't know how to dance, but they're, uh, you know, they're learning how to dance and so they're put on point and the process to get strong, you know, can be torturous because they're learning something that is difficult and they're not quite formed yet as a dancer. Let's say they're 12, 13 or whatever. So they don't quite have the strength of the legs, they don't have the coordination, so that's where the bad rap of point shoes really come. By the time the girls are 16, 17, it's not a problem at all. Uh, it, the point work is like a piece of instrument, like the tennis racket, so our guys, um, they're, they're coming very comfortable now on point. But, uh, you know, they buy a pair of point shoes. Uh, they, after class, they, you know, play around on point and so on and so forth. But they're, they're trained dancers. So that means they already have the coordination. They already have the musculature to handle it. So it's just adding on to the skill of ballet dancing. Uh, it's just sort of almost the same as folk dance, I mean, uh, character dancing. You know, we're not really taught in America to be you know, uh, really good character dancers, but it's just another skill, and that's point work as well. Um, to Comey, for instance, who did the lead of Paquita, I mean, his point work is like almost unbelievable. Uh, and he trained for two years uh, in Russia at the Valganova School, and so his training is absolutely fantastic. Jake Speakman, who did the Swan Queen, uh, went to Hunter College, where he also uh, worked on point, uh, and so that uh, Jake uh, Trent, for instance, who did the lead of Barocco, he did his MA and worked on point and stuff like that. So it really comes with a mixed bag. Uh, so point work is only not possible if something is wrong with your feet, such as you have blisters or then you're very uncomfortable. But otherwise, it's, it's actually fun. And uh, you really feel, have you ever gotten in the morning and done like this great stretch and you just feel so great? Well, that's what point work can feel like. You, know, you, you really feel pulled up and um, uh, everything is flowing and it's really great, especially when you turn. 
If you turn on point, it's really exciting uh, to turn on point because you can't uh, fake that because you'll fall flat on your face. <laughs> so I'm going to just pull three words from what you just said as, our, as, as my closing comment. It's fun, it flows, and it feels great. That seems like a nice summary of what we're seeing this week. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.